Well, very good. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, for this month's Q and A uh, on the Ask a Child Therapist series. We are here for parents and caregivers this evening. Um, going to be talking about self care, the incredibly important topic of self care for parents and caregivers. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day. Um, as you may know, Family Service and Guidance Center specializes in helping kids and families, uh, kids who are challenged with uh, things like anxiety, depression, ADHD, behavioral challenges. Um, so that is what we are here for uh, in particularly the Topeka community and Northeast Kansas. Um, and we're just really pleased to, to be offering these free this free series. Um, and hopefully this evening you'll get some some good information, some tips and, and some recommendations that you can put into action um, starting this evening, maybe even. We'll see, Karen, no pressure. Uh, <laughs> um, we do welcome your questions uh, this evening. If you do have something, um, feel free to put it in the chat. We do have several questions uh, that we're going to answer already uh, this evening. So I now am going to turn it over to our Director of Clinical Operations, Karen Smothers. Uh, she kindly agreed to share her time and expertise with us tonight. So hello, Karen. Hi, friend. How are you, Pam? I am good. Thank you. So a little bit about me, if, if I can introduce myself. Uh, so my name is Karen Smothers. I am uh, the Director of Clinical Operations at Family Service and Guidance Center, and I've been there now for four years, have been in the mental health field and community mental health field for 30 years, and it feels weird even saying that. Um, in terms of my experience, I have worked uh, and provided clinical therapy services and administrative services in the community mental health setting with children and adults, with children who have severe emotional disturbances and adults with severe and persistent mental illness, as well as family therapy and individual therapy, uh, partner relationship counseling, and other experiences but I think perhaps the, the best experiences I've had that have informed my practice is being a parent myself and having raised uh, two boys, the Smothers Brothers, and um, all that parenting and the challenges of parenting give you from being like, you know, school learning and I want to be a family and child therapist to, oh, now I'm doing it and it doesn't always fit into the textbook. So um, I'm happy to also be here with lived experience and I hope that's helpful. That is great. Thank you so much. Um, and we're, we're very fortunate to have you at Family Service and Guidance Center. So thank, th you. thank you for being here. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we just jump into questions if that's okay? Please. Okay, great. So this is probably the most frequent one. Um, I would not be surprised, but how in the world do you find the time for self-care? You know, working full time, getting the kids ready for bed. How do you fit self-care into those busy schedules? Oh gosh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So as I mentioned, having lived experience as a parent myself for two boys and then working full time, going to grad school, um, their time for self-care seemed um, far away from my thoughts. Like they're just, how do you even fit this into this kind of schedule? We're just grinding our teeth and getting through it. And I remember those moments being on the other side of that now with with the boys grown and flown, um, gives me time to kind of reflect back and think about, about self-care and, uh, and how we did incorporate that even when we were in survival mode and how important it is. So I think um, the important thing about self-care is not how to find time, but you have to make time for it. 
Um, you just have to make time for self-care when our schedules are already too full. And that may really mean um, prioritizing and assessing what tasks and activities that you have that just can wait and what your priorities are, what maybe you need to cut out of an already too full schedule if you feel like you don't have time to take care of yourself and your own needs. Um, and so it may take some thinking through, you know, what is important to you in the moment right now. And maybe taking an inventory of what is consuming most of your time and replacing activities that aren't really benefiting you in the long run with an activity that will pay off in the future. I think a lot of self-care is being kind to your future self um, and planning ahead for things um, so that you're not in a rush later or you're, you, you're being kind of nice to yourself so that you remember, oh, I need to take this in the morning or pack this for the kids or have these appointments or look at that. I made it. I made a uh, an appointment for myself for a massage in the future. I'm going to keep that. So I guess kind of thinking about your future self. Um, I know when I've had to inventory my own time, like feeling I'm so overwhelmed, I don't have time to really do these things. Um, when I really was honest with myself, uh, the time I spend scrolling on my phone through social media is time that I probably could be reading a chapter in a book that I keep promising myself I'm going to read. So I think if we are honest with ourselves about our time in that 24 hour period, um, there are there are priority priorities we can make and things perhaps we know we can cut out that aren't essential. Self-care is essential. Okay, and I almost raised my hand when you said scrolling on the phone. Yeah, <laughs> guilty. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so the next one says, I feel guilty when I take time for myself. How can I not feel guilty? I really like this question um, because with all the expectations sometimes we put on ourselves as a mom, as a parent, I think um, I don't have time for that. It feels uh, so it feels like it's more about self-indulgence. And I guess I wanted to distinguish the difference between self-care and self-entitlement. Uh, so being a parent, we do, there's a lot that we sacrifice in terms of our time or maybe our wants. Um, and we do that for the well-being of our children and so that, that they get what they need. Um, but if you are not operating at your best or taking care of yourself, you're compromising that ability to really be um, with your family, to be in the moment with them and to care for them. So um, when we feel guilty, we need to be thinking about, am I feeling entitled about something or am I indulging in something? Or is this really about taking time so that I'm at my optimal best? So again, self-care is not about indulgence but it is a responsibility. So when we communicate that to those in the helping profession, for example, like other therapists, they all day long take care of other people. How do they take care of themselves? We really emphasize to them, that is your responsibility to take care of yourself because without you doing that, you're not going to have the ability to take care of others. The, the old, I'm on the plane and the and the safety message as always put the oxygen on first so you can help the person next to you or the child next to you. So this is your oxygen. This is your responsibility. And, um, you know, sometimes we work in the helping profession where eager new social workers think they're going to help others 24 seven without a break. And, and that's going to help them serve the needs of all the people who are coming to them for help. But instead, those professionals over time, we know are more have a more tendency to burn out sooner, have a lot of emotional drag and a lot of health problems long term. So I guess I just want to emphasize that self-care is ensuring that you're doing what you need to do to live and function optimally so that you can give to others. And just like without ongoing maintenance for a vehicle, um, like oil changes and good fuel, you wouldn't expect your vehicle to keep humming along when you need it. And the same is true for you and your body and your mind. So you have to have ongoing maintenance, ongoing check-ins, preventative care, just to keep running smoothly.
Oh my gosh. I love that analogy so much. I never <laughs> thought about it that way, but, but it's so true. It is so true. Maybe not a sports car. I'm thinking <laughs> <laughs> something reliable. <laughs> right, 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 right. For sure. For sure. <laughs> okay. So, Hey, the next one um, says I'm a single mom with two kiddos. And again, there aren't enough hours in the day, mm -hmm. but do you have some quick and easy, um, what are some quick and easy little breaks or ideas to squeeze in some self-care? Yeah. Yeah. And this could take some creativity. It's going to be different for different people, depending on what it is they need or like, or what rejuvenates them or energizes them. But of course, of course, exercise. And we hear that everywhere. It is so helpful in terms of getting those neurotransmitters in the brain firing, giving um, you the uh, the air and the the um, the health benefits of walking or running, but some kind of exercise, even if it's just on a little 10 minute break is showing to be incredibly helpful. And that's something you don't have to necessarily do on your own. You can involve the kids and the family in with you. I've seen some um, funny instances of moms doing yoga and the the littles and the animals all joining in. And um, that that, as long as you're in the moment and enjoying it and not feeling like it's a task that you have to complete can really be uh, just a quick and easy um, mo few moments of self-care. Um, sleep, of course, is important, making sure you're getting uh, good sleep as much as you can. Like if you have littles napping when your kids nap, um, even setting your, your alarm for a 10 or 15 minute nap can be very rejuvenating and helpful. Um, it's important you eat right. And I think earlier in the series, I had talked about the difference between self-care and self-soothing. This is a little bit more about preaching to myself, but, um, you know, when you're really stressed, I know I do this when I'm very stressed, I go to food and it's not always healthy food. It's never healthy food that I crave. <laughs> and, um, I've experienced the consequences for that, but eating right. If, if you change that up and don't use food as a self-soothing mechanism, I think about it more self-care eating, right. Food will affect things like your mood, trying to cut down on things like sugars and processed foods, those quick and easy snacks, because they're so convenient doesn't necessarily mean it's going to help you in the long run. Um, things like getting or giving a massage. Uh, I like to call it taking a vitamin D break, which is go sit in the sun for a little bit. Um, I think it's really super important. And to this single mom, um, being mindful. So in the chaos, taking a moment to stop, pause, look around you, to listen, to be in the moment, almost like taking a picture of the moment in your mind and holding on to that. And um, just enjoying that actual moment instead of, as a lot of moms do, it's just that registry of all the things you need to be getting done that day, but instead enjoying the moment that you're in, other suggestions are things like taking a hot shower. Um, some people like taking a long bath, taking time without a screen for anything from a cup of a hot drink or treat, going for long walks in nature or outdoors, putting the kids in a stroller and taking them with you. Um, I, I find singing a song to yourself can be helpful, or especially if it's something that you enjoy, whether it's a mellow song or something upbeat or just singing really loudly in the car with or without the kids. <laughs> and most importantly, we know that humor has some great benefits. So finding things, even in moments when you're stressed, finding those things that you can laugh about. Those are all great, great ideas. Um, I'm taking notes over here, by the way, just saying. Okay. Um, okay, so this this scenario is a little bit longer, so I'm going to read it. Okay. Um, so our family has been blended and then blended some more. So things are a little crazy uh, between who is mom and who is biologically mom in the end. We're, we're really just all trying to work on on loving each other which is sad to say much harder than it's, it's been much harder than we could have ever imagined. So my question is, 
can you please give some advice for non-traditional parents self-care, especially when someone is too prideful to ask for help? Um, she continues to say, or uh, he or she, I can't tell. Uh, our kids see the riff in our relationship. Um, we were never married. My cousin took my kids while I got sober. Good for you. Holy cow. That's amazing. Uh, so now it's been incredibly difficult to work together with her to get them back. She won't allow me into their lives. I am willing to try anything. She says, thank you. Thanks so much for your time. Oh, yeah. That's there's a lot. A lot going on there. Yeah. That's a great uh, question. I'm glad. I'm glad whoever it was that submitted that took the courage to do that. So, okay. Some things that come to mind, because there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so self-care in this situation may, may be to carve some time out alone, um, uh, to have some meaningful dialogue on a regular basis about even how to parent each other's children. That's a big issue in blended families where um, maybe all of those things weren't thought out ahead of time, or I just know as a parent, not even in a blended family, being on the same page with my partner um, for those scenarios you can't plan for because you didn't know your kid was going to do that <laughs> or say that in the moment or however that unfolds, how to be on the same page in front of, in front of the kids. So in trying to be proactive, I might suggest carving out time ahead of time to um, talk through those scenarios. Like, do you want me uh, correcting your child when they get sassy? Or, or what is your ideas of discipline? And what are your expectations for me to help support you? I think talking through those things ahead of time will be really important in a blended family. Um, and all families, especially a blended family. Um, and then maybe within that establishing rules and expectations that you have in terms of like how to respond to the children, who sets the rules for who, how to ensure that you are both in agreement with expectations, how to be consistent um, with all of the children, what that looks like. Is it um, age appropriate? Um, is it developmentally appropriate? Taking all that into factors. And again, that kind of forward planning and taking time to really talk through that. And then maybe talking through the debrief, like if things don't go well and their tempers are high um, and there's a lot of emotions, is giving yourself time to regroup. Um, and again, maybe carving out a regular time with your partner so that you're saying, okay, what happened Tuesday night there? Because I was not my best self and I didn't know how to respond to you when, when this was said, let's think through a better way that we could have handled that. I mean, having that really meaningful discussion, I think is going to be helpful in the long run um, for your future planning and then self-care so that you know what to expect and you've had some meaningful communication with your partner. Um, but then um, maybe spend time together. It can be helpful. It can be even um, therapeutic in some ways to talk with your partner about your past experiences, good and bad with parenting and your own experiences with your parents in terms of your relationships, how maybe you want that to change. What are things you want to change from your childhood relationship with your parents or things you want to replicate? in this current relationship, like what worked well. Like I, I appreciated when my dad spent time with me in his workshop and allowed me to play with his tools. That was something that was really important to me. How can I replicate that? Or how can we replicate that in our children's lives? So um, it's also nice to use that time, that, that kind of carved out time with your partner to talk through some of those expectations and experiences because you're not only bonding and sharing with your partner, but you're also setting up kind of a context for, for how you're going to parent your family and your children. Um, but make sure you, you just schedule some fun time as a family. I know um, trying to get everything done and being task focused, but being silly that I think you need to, if you have to plan it, go ahead. But that just silly fun time with a family is really important. Again, the giggling, the laughing, sometimes those are the things the kids are going to remember and hang on to more than the big trips or the big activities that, that are important to you. They, they might find something meaningful in the simple things. And then I guess for, for this particular um, 
question and for this person, I just want to, to say self-care when you're in recovery requires kind of maintenance and staying in touch with either a sponsor or a self-help group. Um, make sure you are prioritizing your self-care um, because your recovery depends on it. So maybe schedule time for check-ins with a recovery coach or a counselor, even when things are going well. So that again, you're maintaining your sobriety, you're maintaining, um, you have those strengths and supports in your life for when things do get stressful, when things um, may go bad in life and you're most vulnerable. You wanna make sure you have that framework set up for yourself. And, and something else I might suggest again is um, including your partner in your own recovery plan. So I'm assuming, or I hope, that um, you've talked to your partner about your sobriety, about your recovery and your experiences, and how you may want to incorporate them in a recovery plan so that they know when you're struggling and most vulnerable and can help support your sobriety and recovery. If you don't have a recovery plan, it's important that you make one. So maybe ask for help and how to start a recovery plan if you don't have one. Ask your partner how um, they can help keep you accountable to your plan. Excellent. 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 And again, um, just to, to reiterate, kudos for you uh, to to the, the person who asked this question on getting sober and having the courage to put it out there. And that's what these opportunities are for. We want to support and help you in any way we can. So uh, thank you again for that. So this one's uh, a, a little... Uh, less lengthy uh, as far as the question. Um, what are some healthy and productive ways to take good care of myself? You've kind of talked a little bit about um, some of the ideas, but are there any other um, thoughts and ideas that you'd like to share? Oh, yeah. Um, again, taking a walk, exercising. Um, some people, I've seen some really cool ones, are knitting. That's becoming a thing again. So things like taking up a new hobby or knitting, reading books, listening to music, gardening. Some people enjoy yoga as part of self-care, um, the arts or painting. Um, a lot of people like going fishing, they find that very soothing and you're in nature and, and there's there's a quietness to it. Um, so all those kind of things are good ideas to take care of yourself. Just keep in mind that this is about self-care. It's not self-indulgence or self-soothing. So again, self-care is about being proactive, about taking breaks, things that will reset your mind and your spirit and your body, uh, keeping yourself at a level in which you can function optimally. And what it's hard to just give a list because what you do for self-care is going to be different for each person. For some people, um, their idea of self-care is being alone and the quietness and not being around other people. And for others that need those social connections to feel energized or to feel like they can express themselves, um, they're going to want to be looking for other people to hang out with or socialize with. Um, for others, like for me, I think self-care really has a lot to do with being outdoors, um, seeing, seeing the sun, feeling the breeze in my face, watching the trees, hearing the birds. So for me, um, it's a need to be in the outdoors or being physical. Um, a lot of people, they need to exert energy in some way. Maybe it's not even exercise. Maybe it's like, well, um, my, my husband and I took a bladesmithing class and we, we did some like hammering out uh, on a forge. Um, and so that was kind of fun. And I could see how there was so much energy in it and how that can be um, self-care and, and helpful for some people. Um, so maybe sometimes being physical or some people really needing to work with your hands um, or challenging their mind. So um, all of those kind of things, It I guess it's probably a good time instead of giving just a list, but to take um, take a moment to think about what are the things that you can get absorbed in and to get, give yourself that moment where you can give your mind and body a break that make you feel energized. What are those things to you? Very good. 
and we touched a little bit on this, um, but hopefully you can elaborate, elaborate a little bit. So when I have free time, I catch myself checking my phone, emails, computer, you know, lots of screen time. How can I break the habit? Was this your question, Pam? No, I could be. It could be too. <laughs> oh gosh, it could be. I, it's too. bad. It's bad. Gosh, it is so addictive, and uh, they set it up that way on purpose. So. I know. <laughs> um, easily manipulated by electronics, but or screens, right? They've they've perfected it. But things that uh, okay, I'm talking to myself here too. Uh, give yourself permission to turn it off, to turn off the phone, to turn the ringer off. Um, I even went for a walk and, um, I almost turned around, went back because I realized I forgot my phone and, and thought, but wh why do I need it? I mean, why does it have to be attached to me at all the time? What if somebody can't get a hold of me for 10 minutes? Is that really going to be, <laughs> we used to live like that. I don't, I don't even know how we survived, but we used to go days and weeks and months without having a phone. <laughs> attached to us. So I guess find some protected time away from a screen and set limits around the time that you're on it. There are even apps that will help do that for you and say, um, you know, it's been 10 minutes without a break. This is the time to shut it off. So there's even some um, options within your own electronics to, to help manage your time or set limits. If you're struggling to do that on your own, um, consider a timer. So either the timer on your phone, I know I, I just recently got a Fitbit, so that gives me some timers. Um, and, if, and if electronics is too much, the oven timer, you know, any timer to remind you it's time to change activities, it's time to do something different. Or I'm, or I'm setting myself maybe 10 minutes to do something on my phone. And then when the timer goes off, I know it's it's time to move on to something else. And then, um, like we've been talking about all the different activities and, and taking a self inventory of what would work best for you in terms of self care, allow yourself to get engrossed in an activity that doesn't involve a screen. And I find that um, if I can break away from the screen long enough, I can just as easily get engrossed in being outdoors and in nature and looking at all that's around me. Um, and so suddenly I've forgotten about the screen and what was going on there and can really get um, my attention and, and time and energy into something different. Very good. And I, um, when my son was still in high school, I was so attached to my phone. It one day it just dawned on me that I'm so busy taking pictures. I'm not taking oh, yeah. it all in. Right. So that's one thing that I have learned that I've tried to, you know, that that was behind the camera. The iPhones weren't quite as great as they are now, <laughs> uh, but, but it is hard. I, I mean, I, it is hard for sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, we talked a little bit about this next one. Um, can I include my kids in my self-care time or is it something that I need to do on my own? Yes, you can include your kids in self-care. Yes, yes, double yes. Um, so teaching your kids things like the leisure skills we've been talking about, supporting them to learn new things and just how to let go and be mindful and have fun and laugh or just, you know, what it's like to live in the moment. Kids kind of, I think they come living in the moment. So they're almost better examples at that than we are to them. Um, and maybe watch that, maybe learn from them. Um, so joining and being playful with them, being in the moment with them, uh, that will help them identify what activities or things they can do that are meaningful to them in the future that they can use. And as they get older about, um, things that they can do for their own self-care. So uh, introducing them to new um, ideas and activities and art and music and fishing and carpentry and all those things can help kind of develop a palette of things that they can choose to um, get engrossed in for their own self-care in the future. And so also while you're doing that, demonstrating for your kids how to take care of yourself 
is another responsibility of parenting. Um, it's an, it's another reason why we should be prioritizing the need to take care of ourselves because that is modeling for our children how they should be doing it as well. Instead of resorting to things that are self-soothing, whether that's you know not eating well, whether that's using alcohol or drugs to, to self-soothe those uncomfortable feelings or that stress, um, when you're getting uh, too overwhelmed. So um, absolutely enjoy your kids, invite them to be part of um, your activities and self-care, but then also setting healthy boundaries so that they see you taking a break or or deciding not to engage in absolutely everything that comes down the road at them. We'll teach them a model for them how to do that too. Great, great. So the next one it is a really good one. How do I know when I'm not taking care of myself? Are there, you know, warning signs? I know that that sounds kind of ominous, but warning signs that I really need to stop and kind of take some time and no, as you said, make some time mm -hmm. for self-care. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if this list is going to be just my personal <laughs> list or a general list, but of course, when people uh, get overwhelmed and need those breaks and self-care, uh, oftentimes we see irritability and agitation. Um, mostly we see burnout, people just burning out because they, they put too much in and never gave themselves time to rejuvenate. Um, then you kind of see people who experience apathy, like they, it's like <laughs> they're caring fatigued. Like I, I'm just, I gave too much and now I, I'm kind of closing in and I can't care anymore or don't want to care anymore. Um, of course, things like depression and anxiety, um, high blood pressure. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, there, there's more and more uh, research and evidence out there about mindfulness and self-care and how it is benefiting uh, chronic disease, heart disease, diabetes, blood sugar, blood pressure, um, cholesterol, uh, recovery from heart surgery. Like it's amazing. So um, again, the chronic health problems is another sign. Um, a lot of physical complaints and concerns, sleeplessness um, and insomnia, obsessing about things in this kind of anxious loop that sometimes we get into, myself included. Um, I also see people who have just not taken that time and who are burning out just this um, overwhelming pessimism about the world and about life and the way they look at things and then very negative outlook and in this kind of worrying about things that haven't happened or, or that they could happen. And then again, engaging in self-soothing activities that are not necessarily helpful that may lead to things like drinking or substance use to soothe uncomfortable feelings and relax. And that's where we see people really vulnerable um, who are in recovery or are trying to maintain their sobriety. Um, really when, when they aren't taking that time for self-care and regrouping um, are become very vulnerable to uh, substance use disorders. Yes. Yes. And you, you've talked a little bit about this one, um, but I think it's it's worth uh, definitely worth asking. So um, they say I'm barely making ends meet financially and things, of course, everybody's feeling it are getting more and more expensive. So are there some what are some free or low cost self-care ideas? Yeah, mentioned already were things yeah. um, and activities that really need to be tailored to what fills your bucket as a parent. So remember, remember that. Um, but a lot of the things we mentioned don't didn't involve money. So mindfulness, adequate sleep, journaling, walking, changing your scenery, vitamin D breaks. At least they aren't taxing sunlight yet. Uh, spending time outdoors, listening to nature. All of those things don't necessarily involve money. Okay, so one of my favorite, I don't know that this was necessarily, well, I think it might've been for my mom, a, self, a little quick self-care thing uh, when I was little. If I had behaved when I we went grocery shopping or something, the, the fun treat would be just to go to the puppy store 
and go look at all the puppies. <laughs> and it didn't cost anything because Lord knows we, we never bought a puppy. <laughs> but by God, that made us both happy. <laughs> yeah, how could not <laughs> playing with puppies or looking at them not be, yeah, exactly. not be just so much, so right? much fun and just kind of get you recentered. Yes. <laughs> Oh, shoot. And just a reminder, um, for those of you who are on, if you have questions, please type them in the chat. Um, I haven't seen anything come through yet, but we that, that's what we're here for tonight. So don't forget that. Uh, let's see here. So we've only got one left. Okay. Okay. Um, I've got a friend. Not me personally. This is the question. No. Oh, okay. Uh, well, I may too. I've got a friend uh, that's been burning the candle at both ends. And I'm worried about her. What can I do to help? Is this one of those questions that always it's about you, but you you couch it in terms of like, so I have a friend, wink, wink. <laughs> Actually, no. You called me out on the one okay. about the screen uh, uh, addiction. That is, that was me. Okay. I would not <laughs> know it wasn't. <laughs> um, so kind of in, it's summarizing a lot of what we've already said. Um, sometimes people, um, uh, I love this. I heard this in a podcast. You need your support network, but you also need a challenge network, right? If you just hang around people who agree with you all the time, you're going to get people who agree with you all the time, even when maybe you need to be challenged. So having a friend like this, who is maybe part of your challenge network, where you have such a good rapport with somebody that you can of course be supportive, but you can also challenge them is, is going to help people grow and, um, just, I think real live, have more enriching relationships and live more fully. So as maybe, um, a support to your friend, but also out of concern and love for them, inviting them to consider like, what are you doing for your self care? And can I help you with that? Um, so inviting her to join you on walks or breaks, offering to help maybe watch the kids if, if that's what he or she needs to, um, be alone. Um, it's really important in engaging someone in that conversation, just to say, you know, I'm, I'm telling you this, or I'm asking about this because I'm concerned about you and I care about you. And I, I'm really worried about you burning yourself out. Um, maybe gently ask what she's doing to find time to care for herself and let her know that you're asking because you do care. And, and maybe just even asking some questions about how to make that, how, how she could make time for herself to do that. And then in, in doing so, um, and maybe planning with her, how you can maybe be part of that, that plan to give her a break if that's what she needs or to check in with her once a week, um, or to come over to the house Monday for dinner or whatever those things are for the, for that friend. So, um, again, maybe being part of your friend's challenge network in, in a loving and gentle way. Yes. Yes, yes, and yes. Very good. Very good. Well, that, so that was the, the last question in pre-submitted questions. Let me double check on the chat one more time. Um, I'm not seeing anything at this point. Um, any other questions? I, I again, want to make sure that we get questions answered here. I'll just uh, maybe yeah, mention please. one of my favorite videos that I've used in different kinds of trainings that I think is a good reminder for myself of self-care and how to deal with stress is uh, Dr. Mike Evans has this great series of videos. You can just find them on YouTube. And he has one that's called, um, what's the single most important thing you can do to manage your stress? And then it's called 90 and then colon 10. If you Google Dr. Mike Evans and just 90, 10, you're going to find that video. It'll take 11 minutes of your time for a self-help break. Um, but he's got some, <laughs> it's a great creative way to talk about not only um, self-care and stress, but uh, it's presented in a way that shows you research and it kind of advises you just about how how much responsibility and how you can choose to manage your stress and how you can choose to look at the world. So um, that's one of my favorites and, and I like to watch it from time to time. I have parts of it memorized because I need to hear it. I, whoops, I am gonna check that out. 
I have not heard of that. So that's yeah, please do. Yeah, appreciate that that resource. We can all use extra resources, you know? Yes, yes, um, absolutely. For sure, for sure. Well, um, so I'm not seeing any other questions. Okay. Uh, just, just a couple of quick reminders for everybody. Um, we did uh, record this. We will be putting, on, putting it on the FSGC website. If you needed a or need a certificate of attendance, please just uh, send me your first and last name in the chat um, and your email address. We can get a certificate out to you. Um, let's see what else. There are a bunch of other helpful topic videos out on the web page. If you go to fsgctopeka.com and click on the blue parenting resources button in the top right corner, um, if you know you're you're challenged by or you're what you're noticing some things with your kiddo, we might have uh, some helpful tips yeah. in a in a past video for you. So please do check that out. Next month's, gosh, let me try this again. Next month's topic: <laughs> kids and ADHD. Um, that is a a uh, much talked about topic. Um, and you'll you'll have the opportunity to ask specific questions about that next month and continue to post videos on Facebook. So I hope you're you're checking that out as well. So Karen, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. What great tips. I, I've got some some uh, absorption to do on my drive home tonight. Um, lots of good. Okay. <laughs> so thanks, thanks uh, again uh, to you, Karen, to all of you who joined us. And uh, we hope to see you um, at a future webinar. So have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.